Uh, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, so my name is Enrique Soriano. I'm a rheumatologist from Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. I work at the Hospital Italiano Buenos Aires. And today joining me, uh, a great uh, friend of mine that we have been um, seeing and working together for a long time is uh, Valderillo Acevedo from uh, Brazil. He works at the uh, Universidad Federal do Paraná in Brazil, a place that is close to Argentina. We call the Gauchos, uh, people from there. So uh, to me, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you, uh, Valderillo, in this uh, uh, new edition of the podcast series. So how are you? I'm fine. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, Soriano, and thank you uh, for the for CSF for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here to record this podcast. Great. So first, uh, tell a little bit about you. You joined the University of uh, um, uh, Federal do Paraná uh, since 1996. Uh, so. What can you tell us about your uh, university, your hospital, and your research programs there? Yeah, actually the Federal University of Paraná is one of the oldest federal universities in Brazil. Uh, we have a struggle with Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. We, uh, looking at the, the story, uh, it, it's not the oldest uh, university in Brazil, it's uh, one of the oldest federal universities. I started to work as a professor uh, in 1996, but, but I finished my undergraduate medical course in, in, in 1989. So I, uh, I, I made a, a, res, a residence pro, medical residence program in, in, in 90 and 91 and then rheumatology for the next two years. So I, I, I've been working for the university in it, at the university for more than, for more than 25 years. So my university, I am the head of the rheumatology unity of the, uh, the, the big hospital is a university hospital with more than 500 beds. And I started to see patients with spinal arthritis in, the, in 1990, 1995, actually before uh, uh, being a professor, uh, when I was just a physician working for the hospital. And I, uh, I, I have a great experience with, with the uh, medical residence program in, my, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the hospital. We started a lot of uh, clinical research at, at that moment. Uh, but and just in, to, in 2008, I started with my uh, private uh, research investigation, clinical investigation unit. But it, uh, it makes part uh, of the university. Uh, but it's linked by, by my um, um, outpatient service. It's not a, a public uh, research, clinical research center. So uh, I've been working with the spinal arthritis this is the focus of my experience. Uh, I made part of very important groups on spinal arthritis uh, worldwide. There's RAPA that you are a member also, and also ASAS, uh, that it's uh, all other very important group that have been studying and, and joined together, joining together many very good professionals interested in, in spinal arthritis. Uh, my focus is in new drugs, in the treatment of new uh, uh, clinical strategies for psoriatic arthritis and also for uh, actual spinal arthritis. Uh, I know that you have been interested in those topics as well. Uh, but as, Perhaps, I'm yeah, sorry. Before, you, before we enter your research uh, interest, I think it's, it's very nice to stress that you are in a large city in a large university because uh, perhaps people will think in Brazil they only think about Sao Paulo and Rio and you are in a large city in a large uh, hospital outside those uh, cities so I think that's uh, very interesting. Um, 
also um, we want to know it would be nice to why did you select uh, rheumatology and what did attract you at, at that time to enter rheumatology and what is attracting you now to stay in rheumatology so if you can well this is a very complex question yeah <laughs> I, I, at the beginning now, I, I would like to be a surgeon, like a general surgeon. So I was influenced by a very well-known, renowned uh, rheumatologist in my hospital that, is, well, that actually has died. He died very young, with the, uh, 49 years old, but he had a very good background on rheum in rheumatology and he influenced me because he opened the, the doors for me and I could uh, follow him seeing patients with uh, ankylosis, spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, etc. And then I decided to do internal medicine. And after in the, the internal medicine, uh, my uh, uh, internal medicine formation, official formation, I went to a, a, a medical residence program in rheumatology. Uh, that's why it's because uh, we uh, we see patients very complex patients with autoimmune diseases, rheumatic disease, most of the patients, and the immunology, the clinical immunology, um, actually uh, interested me a lot at the beginning because I I when I was discussing with my other colleagues, I I noticed that nobody actually knew about. Uh, the immun uh, had an immunology background as the rheumatologists rheumatologists have uh, no no other specialty like cardiology or nephrology and I uh, I was really inclined to be a rheumatologist since the I beginning. think that pro probably that's one of the problems we have in our um, um, education because uh, here in Argentina is the same. We don't have any exposure to rheumatology during our uh, medical school. I think probably is the same in Brazil, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah actually, we have just a discipline of rheumatology in the undergraduate years, in the third year. But the, by the, uh, the, the, uh, most of the, the doctors, they learn rheumatology when they do medical uh, residence medical programs or a specialization, specific specializations in the area of rheumatology. So um, what is attracting uh, to rheumatology now, nowadays? So it's the same idea or the uh, different things now? Yeah, I have different things, but uh, yeah, uh, my passion is, is also is, 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 uh, of, uh, is a small arthritis, of course. But I see patients with scleroderma, then because of my research, clinical research center, we have been testing so many different therapies and so many different rheumatic diseases like scleroderma, and sugaring syndrome, and also lupus. That my interests have been, I have a very, we have a very comprehensive camp of investigation in the rheumatic diseases. So I think that I, I have new, uh, New ideas with uh, of being of learning in, in other in other diseases and to see look at the connection with the spondylitis and look at the connection of with the, 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 the with rheumat other rheumatic disease the connection among them and so and the also the treatment the, the treatment strategies of these in these in these diseases. So you, you have been involved in clinical trials for a while. Uh, so tell us what's the challenges uh, you find there and what's the, how do you see this will uh, evolve, evolve uh, on the next years? Because lately we have been a, a big growth on the uh, number and quality of clinical trials. So how do you see these, these fields nowadays? Yeah, there's a lot of challenges to to one that wants to be a, a investigator, a clinical investigator, especially in those. Uh, I mean, in the in the countries like Brazil, Argentina, that we we have uh, great challenges uh, in, in becoming in the clinical investigators. 
first of all, we have a now things are uh, uh, things are changing, of, of course, but we have very good, very great problems, a lot of problems with our ethics committee, the Central Ethics Committee in Brazil. We have a, a governmental ethics uh, committee, and they usually delayed some uh, clinical research in Brazil. And we, we have lost a lot of opportunities to conduct clinical trials because, as you know, we have a lot of people living in Brazil, more than 200 million people live in Brazil. Different people from 70% of our genes are from uh, Europe, European uh, Europeans, from Portuguese, from German, from Italians, from, and also a small, uh, a small percentage is African and also from Asia. But we have a very mixed population. We have a, a very good camp, a very good field to to conduct trials in in, uh, in in my country. So, and the other thing is to have a, to train to have a formal training in in clinical investigation. So most of what I've learned, I learned by myself, uh, talking with in, with uh, with other in the. Uh, uh, principal investigation, international principal investigators, but also with the farmer industry. They have a, a very good program, a very good education program to clinical researchers. So, and yeah, yeah of course, they are very interested in having people uh, with a good background in clinical research to conduct their trials, to test their molecules, to, to test their investigation of products. So, there's a lot of the, the challenges, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, apart from your interest in spondylar arthritis, you are a well-known expert in biosimilar. So I, I know you have been working on that and publishing on that a lot. So what's the state of uh, biosimilars in um, Brazil or Latin America, and especially, especially in Brazil? Either are they entering the market? Do you have problem with that? Or what is, what's your point of view related to that? Well, I started to study biosimilars in 2008. It's 12 years ago. And I published the first paper on biosimilars in rheumatic disease. This was published in Brazil. Uh, it's uh, what do we know about uh, uh, biosimilars? And I noticed that nobody knew anything about biosimilars in my country. So I started a continuing medical education program. And in the next year, after the publication of this paper, and of course the Europeans have published it at the same year, but in the end of the same year, another, uh, another paper uh, in 2010, where I started the forum, a Latin American forum. First of all, a, a, a first a Brazilian forum on biosimilars, and then a Latin American forum on biosimilars. And we are in the 10th edition. This year we have uh, a, lot, a, a web meeting because of the, the, pand the pandemic of uh, COVID-19. We're gonna do, uh, we're gonna have a, a web meeting, of course. So uh, biosimilars are increasing, the number of biosimilars are increasing worldwide. And now we have a practical, uh, routinely daily experience with biosimilars. We have, a, uh, four biosimilars, uh, um, four different um, uh, biosimilars of different molecules in Brazil. Um, they are in the public market. As you know, the public market in Brazil is the, the biggest one. Uh, uh, we have we have been uh, it's the 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 the, 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 uh, the biggest purchase of biosimilars in the public market is made in Brazil. We we spend a lot of money uh, uh, buying biologics in general, but biosimilars, we are saving money with biosimilars and it's very interesting for the government to save money. And biosimilars have proven that are, they are really similar because we have a lot of discussions on, first, first of all, in the, the exercise, in the totality of evidence, but, but first of all, with, uh, with the, the similarity, the bio, biophysical, biochemically and biophysically uh, similarities, uh, and then with the, the clinical similarities, we started discussions on, on extrapolation indication and now interchangeability uh, uh, in, uh, but, and pharmacovigilance, 
But I think that the, the biosimilars have crossed all these barriers. They are crossing these barriers and they are being more and more used worldwide. And Brazil is not different. Uh, we're gonna use, we're gonna produce locally some bio, biosimilars also in Brazil with a, a very good strategy that the Brazilian government has started uh, some years ago. That is a, pro, a partnership for product development where they transfer international technology of biologics to local companies in Brazil. It's a very complex uh, a system, but it, it's, it's working, it's working. And now we have uh, the first biosimilars made uh, by a, a transfer technology that it's a biosimilar produ produced by Samsung. Well, yeah, it's good. I think they, they came to stay. Uh, and I think that, uh, well, uh, at the end, if um, they lower the prices, I think that is a good thing. And I think the good thing is also that our regulatory agencies are improving in the way they are evaluating the new biosimilars that they are coming. So um, um, I think that's a, a great topic and congratulations for all the work you have done related to that. Um, I think that uh, a lot of people that is interested in um, cytokines have been um, very well surprised by the fact that um, a new kind of drugs uh, have uh, entered the market and we have more and more and those are the JAK inhibitors. Um, you were also involved in the first clinical trials with tofacitinib um, that, as we all know, has been approved for many years for rheumatoid arthritis, but now also for psoriatic arthritis. So where do you place JAK inhibitors in rheumatoid arthritis and in psoriatic arthritis in our countries? What, what do you see is happening now in Brazil? And what do you think is going to happen with this new kind of, of drugs? Yeah, well, I think that uh, we are going to talk on small molecules, right? For a very specific target, specific target molecules, and, and, and jack inhibitors are one of one of this or one of them. It's a class of small molecules target uh, specific. Yeah, uh, I think that tofacitinib has a very comprehensive clinical development development program. So tofacitinib has been tested initially in in our rheumatoid arthritis and also psoriasis, in Crohn's disease. But in psoriatic arthritis, I made part of the, the clinical trial. I'm one of the authors of the, of the pivotal study uh, in psoriatic arthritis, especially for patients that, who have failed to anti-TNF. Uh, tofacitinib specifically is a good option to treat patients with psoriatic arthritis and also rheumatoid arthritis. We have very similar results uh, and cutaneous in the skin and also in arthritis, very similar to anti-TNS also, actually. But we have been looking at new uh, JAK inhibitors that have emerged since the TOEFL was launched, as also upadacitinib and also badacitinib, that they have, a, of course, a very important places to treat rheumatic diseases. And I think that in the future, we are going to have a lot of small molecules to treat patients with rheumatic disease, as uh, what happened in oncology, because the experience has started with oncology, and now we are taking advantage to study these molecules also in rheumatic diseases. And the experience has been, have been, uh, has been very good uh, all of these years. We have a lot of patients using tofacitinib in my country, to treat uh, rheumatoid arthritis and also to treat psoriatic arthritis. And we expect to have uh, more people uh, being treated with JAK inhibitors in the next few years. Yeah, <clears throat> and because uh, I think that they also their place in therapy is changing, at least here in Argentina, when we look at our registry, a couple of years ago, there were 70% of the patients uh, receiving JAK inhibitors were uh, second line. So after failure of, uh, of uh, probably another biologic. But nowadays, is, the last time was more 50 and 50. 
So a lot of people is using it first line after the mark failure, and now it's probably even more and more. So it's the same happening in Brazil. Is people using more and more this drug as first line after yeah, the yeah, mark the failure? first line uh, is, is uh, in Brazil. The, uh, of course, the, the um, tofacitinib is being uh, provided by the the public system. Now, since the last year, it's being provided by the public system. I think the number of patients treated with tofacitinib is going to increase. Uh, it's it's going to increase, and it's going to increase. Actually, it's going to increase a lot. Uh, 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 but uh, but I think that uh, even in the in the uh, in private market, we have been looking at the numbers and patients uh, treated with baricitinib and tofacitinib is is increasing also. Uh, I think that we are going to have also uh, more and more patients being treated with jack inhibitors. Of course, yeah. Yeah, um, I think it, there is a future there. Uh, well, more and more drugs are coming into the market, so I think that that's also a, a new challenge for for all of us. Um, while we are uh, chatting here, the, well, they, in Brazil has been a is a, a big concern, and also in the rest of the world. But it seems that in Europe and some other places, well, the um, thing are slowing down but uh, Brazil is now in the center of the very very hot um, uh, place related to the COVID-19 pandemic so it's it's kind of, of very interesting because uh, we rheumatologists have been involved with the COVID-19 because of the number of drugs we are uh, we very often use that have been tried uh, to treat these patients. So what can you tell us about this um, relationship between the, our drugs, the treatment of COVID-19, and all these cytokine storms that have been uh, def uh, described in COVID? So do, what's your views or your experience related to that? Yeah, as you know, yeah. A rheumatologist, as you said, uh, are being involved with COVID-19 because of the drugs and also we want to know what is going to happen with our patients using immunosuppressive drugs. Are they more susceptible to, uh, to COVID-19 and once uh, contracted the infection, they are, are more, are they are more are they susceptible to have a critical uh, a critical evolution of COVID-19, that's where there is the cytokine storms. So uh, unfortunately in Brazil, numbers of patient infected is increasing, is increasing because of some uh, other problems, especially because problems and the people that are conducting the, the policies, the health policies in my country. But, uh, but, but in general, the, the doctors, are, the physicians are very well prepared to face uh, COVID-19 in my country. So Curitiba, we have, uh, um, we, we, don't, we actually, we don't know if we are in the peak of the wave, we, if we are in the, 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 the higher part of the wave of the infections. But, um, but our experience has been very good with, with some biologics. Tocilizumab, uh, and also um, with, with uh, uh, small doses of corticosteroids that have been proven to work very well in patients with critical cases. But we have a lot of other biologics being tested, and also small molecules like tofacitinib and baricitinib being tested in COVID-19 critical cases. Uh, I mean, with patients with cytokine storm. We have anti-IL-1, anakina has been also uh, tested in, in COVID-19. So it, it, uh, we are trying to move forward with these molecules because I think that they are a good option. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 and also SARS-CoV-1, they, they infect macrophages, as you know, and they uh, uh, overcome the, the, the primary response of the, the immunomediated response of the human beings they inhibit the, the, uh, the, the production of interferons. 
and also they they provoke a, 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 a production of other important cytokines like IL-6 and IL-1, but also IL-10 is very, it's overexpressed in COVID-19, but IL-1 IL beta, of course, and it, it opens the doors to use some uh, molecules that we have often used it in rheumatic diseases. And, and, and this is, and, and we have actually, I understand that we are in some cases very well prepared to treat these patients, more than infectologists and more than pneumologists. They are looking at the patients in very uh, uh, severe cases. But they often in my country, they ask for the opinion of rheumatologists to, in some cases. And frequently I am I'm being called to, to give my opinion in the case. And I am, uh, uh, and I'm very motivated to use biologics from all of these biologics. And tocilizumab is, is in the, in, uh, I think it's, it's one of the best that we have now. We have not results from other trials. I, I know that it has a lot of molecules that have uh, been tested uh, if you look at the clinical trials.gov, you're going to see a lot of uh, molecules uh, that and also that have been uh, that are recruiting patients with COVID-19. A lot of different clinical strategies, but tocilizumab has uh, the, we have a, a lot of cases being treated with tocilizumab. You uh, actually we are now uh, uh, trying to to come up with new molecules, but. We are trying to understand what's the best moment to treat these patients because we don't have biomarkers to see what is who is going to be the patient that will um, have a bad or a good evolution with COVID-19. So we face all these cases as the same. But I think that it's a good moment to, before the cytokine storming to use uh, some, some of our molecules. We have a lot of discussions with uh, antimalarials, with hydroxychloroquine or with cochicine, in fact, uh, that's uh, some other studies. But uh, and actually, we don't have evidence, good evidence, to do to, to prescribe these drugs. So this is a new this is a new fa field. It's a very fascinating field. That is a, 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 a field that makes our knowledge in immunology with the the knowledge of infectology with the knowledge of infectious diseases. So it's, it's very, it's, uh, uh, I think it's, it's uh, 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 I think that we have a lot of uh, things to learn. We have a lot of uh, things to do with COVID-19. And I hope that of course, that this pandemic, the pandemics uh, that finishes as soon as possible because yeah, you know, it, it has changed our life, uh, our life, our family, our life, our professional lives as doctors, uh, we have a lot of telemedicine now, um, teleconsultations with patients, and yeah, we have changed our our lives. We have changed our behavior. Our, our, uh, yeah, our absolutely. Uh, but I think, as you mentioned, uh, I think it's a uh, it's a great thing to be a rheumatologist now. I think it's uh, uh, fascinating times, and I think we will learn more and more about cytokines uh, related to this uh, pandemic as well. So I think it's a, it's a really good time uh, to be here and a good time to, to do some research related to that. And I think we will learn a lot. And again, uh, it seems that um, our patients are doing well and they do not experience an increased risk of, of uh, having a uh, the disease or a bad uh, outcome. So I think that's good news for our patients as well. So uh, finally, uh, we all, those that know, have knew you for a long time, we know about your interest in art and music, and even you publish on a paper related to Grandma Moses and her rheumatoid arthritis and how she started painting. Um, so, well, um, I know, but I heard that now you're changing scope, but you were, um, you have a Beatle band and you have been playing in Liverpool for several years. So what's music for you? And 
what's music for our patients? Uh, yes, medicine has started not like a science, but like an art. And I think that medicine has a little bit of art. If you are an artist, I think that you're going to be a good doctor, a good physician. Huh? So I started to, to play instruments like uh, acoustic guitar, flute, since I was 10 years old. So I started with my musical career before medicine. <laughs> so I try to preserve this in my, in my life. That is good for me. It's a kind of relax when I have a relax. But I do it professionally sometimes. We have a lot of we had a lot of opportunities to play to very important names in rheumatology. So Phil Mills, Phil Mills, that's a great friend of us. He plays cello, and he was invited. He invited me to play. And so we have played in in, uh, uh, in a National Psoriasis Foundation dinner, official dinner last year, uh, where he he was awarded by the National Psoriasis Foundation, and he invited us to play at the dinner. So I played in some rapper meetings. I played in, in the, uh, uh, the Argentinian Congress of Rheumatology, as you know, uh, sometimes, and the Brazilian Congress. We played a lot of good. It's, it's very good to be a musician. I think I don't know uh, what to say to you, but it makes it makes a. I have a benefit. I have a benefit, and my patients also have a benefit because they clearly look at me and see that I'm. Uh, in a good shape and a, with a good mind to treat them. <laughs> but I actually, I wrote some papers in, 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 in on visual, famous visual artists that have suffered from rheumatic diseases. I published it on Gaudi, Gaudi. Um, I published on Ale Jardinho, that's a very famous painter, uh, sculptor in Brazil. And some other papers. And I, I, I actually, I wrote a book on visual artists, uh, famous visual artists that have suffered from rheumatic disease. And Anna Mary Moses is one of that. Anna Mary Moses is the most popular uh, painter, uh, naive painters in the United States. Uh, he took up painting when she was 70s, she was 71 years old. And he uh, became very famous when he was 71 years old. Uh, and she died with 101 years old. She, she died of very, very, uh, 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 with, the, with the disease. He, she suffered with the disease all of their lives. But actually, uh, she started to, to, to paint because some, some friends told her to do something because she was working with agriculture. She lived in Virginia, one of the states of the United States. For some years, he did, she didn't see airplanes. The, man going to the moon, she, she, she didn't have a television in, uh, at her home, but she learned to, to paint. And though she, she had no techniques to paint, she was a naive painter. And because of the painting, she became very famous because one Marchand looked at up some, some paintings of her and he was very interested and, and, and took up the, 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 the paintings to the, uh, the, to the uh, Art Modern Museum in New York, and she became very famous in, in, in a couple of years after learning to paint. So this is a very good example to my patients, and I also use Grandma Moses as an example to do something, to practice something that, 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 that can make your mind right, that, that can, have, can make you relax, that can make you look at the, the life uh, in some other different point of view. So this is a very motivating. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Uh, well, thank you, Valerie. It was great to talk with you. Uh, and I hope everybody enjoys this uh, podcast. Um, I want to uh, remember everybody that they can subscribe to the Cytokine uh, Signaling Forum. And um, there you can see uh, the postcards and also you can um, download uh, papers, uh, also slides, so it's a very comprehensive site and you have a lot of materials there that uh, are very useful. So thank you again and it was a great pleasure to, to see you uh, on, on distance. Bye. Thank you very much, Mariana. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.